Welcome to the Progressive Primitivist Podcast, where we believe that the only way to go forward in religion is to go back to the Bible. If you're a preacher in Churches of Christ, you're probably very interested in the history of the Restoration Movement. And one of the foremost authorities on that history was a man by the name of David Edwin Harrell Jr. Brother Harrell died back in March of 2021, and he finished out his teaching career at Auburn University. And one of the best books on the history of Churches of Christ is his book, Churches of Christ in the 20th Century, Homer Haley's Personal Faith Journey. Over the next few weeks, we're going to share three lectures that Brother Harold gave based on this book. We hope that you enjoy. A slide on for me there. The Well, good to see you guys back. This has been a good class. A lot more of my Auburn students skipped. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to have you, have you here. So <clears throat> I uh, looked over my stuff at noon, and a lot of the things that I have left, we've kind of already run over a little bit in our discussions, so I'm going to kind of quickly get on through this material, and uh, then maybe we can spend, uh, oh, 15, 20, 30 minutes uh, reacting to questions about this material. Now, if there are some people here <coughs> this afternoon who haven't been in on the earlier discussions, um, I don't know how to get you up to where we are uh, at the moment. Uh, it's, uh, there's lots of water under the bridge. But essentially what I've tried to do is outline <coughs> my interpretive framework for the, the restoration movement that we've been part of. There are a lot of other restoration movements around. And uh, this book, I did two earlier books that uh, worked within this conceptual framework about uh, the 19th century divisions in the Restoration Movement. And in this book, I've uh, discussed both the biography of Brother Homer Haley, who was, as I suggested to you this morning, I, I thought just a thoroughly admirable man who kind of humbly and meekly and fearing God made his way through this maze of the Churches of Christ and <clears throat> lived his life as a servant. Uh, but in writing uh, Brother Haley's biography, I felt kind of compelled to look at what has happened to Churches of Christ in the 20th century. And what I see happening is uh, a, a period of growth and uh, relative unity in which you had kind of like-minded people. And as we suggested early, earlier today, those periods of growth and unity are not really unity at all, but because in, a, in an intellectually open environment, the way that people figure out where they're going is through debate and controversy, and it often is done in ways that are not terribly admirable. Uh, but in the years from 1950 to 2000, which is where we were, uh, what we find is that the Church of Christ is divided into these three kind of separations, uh, separated communities. Now, whenever I talk about this, in churches, I, the only thing I don't like about my graphs is that my graphs communicate a very denominational understanding of who the churches of Christ are. And I don't like that kind of understanding. And the truth is, we, we don't have groups in a sense of having separate denominational organizations. The only thing by and large that exists in most churches of Christ remains just local churches. And people but we do align ourselves in separated communities. And uh, by the 1960s, the non-institutional churches were pretty well isolated. And in the 1980s, 1990s, there's been this second kind of echo division in the so-called mainstream churches of Christ between conservatives and progressives. That's a, that's a division that's still ongoing. And essentially what happens is you can define those by institutions and other kind of uh, loci of, of, uh, of uh, influence, and people more or less decide 
you know, where they're going to send their children to school and where the preachers will be trained. And particularly if one is a preacher, the point comes when you can't cross those lines, when you can't preach on both sides of those uh, lines. So let's, let's just look. I, I went through this with you this morning, and that is to suggest that uh, none of this is neat. Not, it doesn't look like my charts in real lifetime at all. Uh, people make their decisions in quite uh, unorderly ways. But finally, what everybody does is everybody decides where they're going to live their life. You select a congregation that you're going to be part of, and you select other kind of institutions that you're <coughs> loyal to. Uh, as I suggested earlier, I think that those decisions very generally today would be made kind of intuitively and subjectively almost rather than intellectually, that is, people find an environment where they're comfortable. Now, in times of crisis, people are often forced to study diligently issues and try to determine exactly what they think is right about issues. But for the most part, I believe people make those decisions uh, on a different basis. Now, uh, in, the, in these two major 20th century divisions, the doctrinal issues, as those of us my age remember quite well, uh, were fairly clearly designed, uh, defined, and there were debates about whether churches could support institutions such as colleges, orphan homes, hospitals, and so on, whether sponsoring church arrangements were scriptural, and what I've described as social gospel issues, uh, things about the extent to which churches were were and should be involved in social activities. Uh, those issues were widely debated. Most people were forced to study them some. A lot of us studied them after the fact. As I said, I think that's what Brother Haley did. Uh, he made his gravitation into the non-institutional camp and then subsequently studied and uh, found out that that's what his convictions were. I believe a lot of people did that. No, in fact, we do that about a lot of things. I'll tell you one little interesting encounter I had during the 1960s with J.W. Roberts uh, here at Abilene. We had, we had a little exchange. I, I didn't do many nasty things during those years, uh, just, just a few maybe. Uh, and uh, a lot of nasty things were done that uh, many people had regrets about. But uh, I wrote, uh, J.W. Roberts wrote an article about the social gospel, and I wrote an article in response saying that I didn't think he knew what it was. And uh, he then wrote an article in response in which he chastised me as a young uh, graduate student, whippersnapper, which I was, uh, and said that many of the points I'd made, uh, that it was true that he had not studied those things um, prior to writing his article. But since my criticism, he had studied them and discovered he was right anyhow. Uh, so so uh, anyhow, I responded to that. And uh, I, I, I'm thankful years later, we had a nice encounter out here at some point and kind of sheepishly approached each other about that exchange. But I, I think uh, uh, we people study those issues when they're forced to study the issues. and. That's, that's perfectly proper. However, as I suggested to you, I think other things were going on in this debate. Uh, that the argument in the institutional division took place partly at this legalistic level of discussing patterns in the old restoration hermeneutic. And there were people, there were people on both sides who debated at that level. And uh, so that if you're looking for legalistic mindsets, legalistic mindsets were on both sides of that divide and remained on both sides of that divide. And both just convinced that they could prove that the others were wrong. Uh, there, was, there was another issue, and, and that's the issue that I suggested that, <clears throat> that uh, I was concerned about 
and that is just this kind of general perception that churches of Christ were changing. And some people, some people were, were quite appreciative of those changes, and what emerged was what I call a booster mentality, the on-the-march spirit, which kind of co contradicted my own commitment to a sense of alienation, separation from the world. Uh, the, that mentality also, or that uh, concept of the new concept of the church, also begins to be critiqued from the left in the 1960s, first by Leroy Garrett and Carl Ketchisad, and subsequently by other people. Now, what I suggested then this morning in summary with regard to this division is that uh, we have divisions all the time of people who, who debate issues and come to different conclusions about what the scriptures teach. But then periodically, I believe what happens in the Restoration Movement is we, we have divisions when we spread out in such a way that we no longer basically agree about who we are and what we're trying to do. Now, I, I'm reasonably sure that the institutional division had sociological characteristics just as the 19th century divisions had, that it did have economic and educational parameters. We can't, can't prove that because there's no data there. Uh, it, you, can, you can prove it in the 19th century. That is, I've, I've done lots of articles in which I looked at 19th century data because the Census Bureau collected information in 1906 and 1626, 36 on churches. And what is quite clear is churches of Christ were the poor churches and disciples of Christ were the rich churches. And uh, there were all kinds of economic disparities there. I think the same thing probably was true in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, there, there were differences in attitude, as I suggested. Uh, the, this old sense of alienation being sojourners was, I think, most preserved in non-institutional churches. Uh, and uh, by progressives on the other end of the spectrum. And as I said, I, I, I wrote that perspective back in the 1960s, in 1962, and suggested that what was happening in this division was not so much an argument about issues, because actually all of the issues had been debated for many, many years. There had been people who had opposed churches contributing to institutions, and, and churches had been having dinner on the grounds forever, and I think we'd still be having dinner on the grounds, uh, had it not been that much, a much broader set of, of questions arose. Now, let me talk now about the second division and uh, in that context give you what my, my assessment is of the central kind of ideological issues that, that go down through the movement and become the uh, kind of dividing lines for, for divisions. The, uh, the present division that's going on in Churches of Christ centers around, as, as you well know, two issues. One, a new hermeneutic, and that is questions about the basic interpretive assumptions that have undergirded the Restoration Movement. And second, questions about the nature of the church uh, that I've suggested here under the term the, the cultural church. Now, I believe that these are the, the two kind of central issues that define our restoration movement. There are a lot of restoration movements, by the way, as, as uh, I suggested to you earlier this morning. Ours is one that, that focuses on certain issues. I mean, you know, the, the, the Amish and the Mennonites, the, the anti-Baptist tradition is a restorationist tradition. Actually, you read... 17th, 18th century religious rhetoric, it's almost all restorationist. I think that's the most powerful driving idea after the Protestant Reformation. The question very generally becomes, what, what are you trying to restore? And if, if you're trying to restore the pattern of New Testament living, then you could end up in an Amish community. If you're trying to restore the gifts of the Spirit, 
and then you can end up in a Pentecostal community. I mean, Pentecostals are quite restorationist. And uh, I, I had, of course, I know them very well, having written four books about Pentecostals, and uh, know a lot of them personally, and had many discussions with them about their restorationism. I don't embrace it. Now, there are many people who come along in our restoration tradition who uh, I, I think not having, not being very rooted in our restoration tradition, look at others and say, well, why haven't we considered that? And my answer is, you know, kind of, I, I have considered that, but if you haven't, you probably need to. Uh, I have to tell you my favorite Pentecostal story. Uh, well, I'm here. I had a conversation one time on this topic with one of the fa my favorite guys that I ever interviewed. Of course, I know most of the leaders in that world now. But there's an old country, East Tennessee faith healer that I've become quite comfortable with, and he's a neat guy, very honest guy. And actually, we did, we did Good Morning America together one time. I took the crew to him, and they filmed him. But uh, he was talking with me one day. We were talking about this, and he said, Oh, Dr. Harrell, he said, you believe in restoration? He said, you guys, said, you preach Mark 16, 16, he that believes in the baptized should be saved, and he believes not shall be damned. But he said, you don't preach verse 17. And that they'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll be healed, and that they'll speak with other tongues. And I said, well, you could argue that, but I said, I I'll tell you, you don't preach verse 18. And they shall... <laughs> pick up serpents and they won't harm them and they shall drink deadly poison. So anyhow, that night, <laughs> so that, that night he was uh, preaching and I was in the audience and he had always recognized me and he said, now, he said, Dr. Harrell is here tonight <laughs> and he said, we were talking earlier today about the scriptures and he said, he asked me why we don't handle them serpents anymore. He said, I can remember when they used to throw those serpents around. He said, we don't do it anymore. He said, I'll tell you why I don't do it. He said, I don't do it because I'm scared of them. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he said, I'm glad that the scriptures say, and they shall pick up serpents. <laughs> Now, me too. That's kind of where I stand on that issue. But, uh, but what we are is essentially a church restorationist movement in origin. And consequently, the concept of the church becomes a, a, a quite uh, important and high issue and one that has been involved in all of the divisions that take place. That is, how do you view the church? Do you view it as essentially a re restored New Testament uh, non-denominational image, or do you view it as a denomination with its own cultural roots and origins molded by its own circumstances? In the Disciples of Christ, Church of Christ Division, that, that was one of the issues. There essentially were two issues, two major groups of issues. One of them surrounded this definition of the church. And the question was, the question defined in the late 19th century was a question, in the early 20th century, was a question of open membership, whether you could receive members from denominations, and what that involved was the question of how do you view the church itself. So... <clears throat> That becomes quite central in this, uh, well, well, actually, in the non-institutional vision, I think it's present, but it's quite critical in the 1980s and 1990s division between progressives and conservatives. Um, the, the argument being the charge that is repeatedly made that the churches of Christ had become, however they defined themselves, simply another cultural denomination, captured indeed by the culture, of uh, politically conservative, Republican, uh, American religious group, 
that behaved and acted, you know, that walked like a duck and quacked like a duck, and uh, so it looked like it was a duck. So, uh, that, as I said, that charge is made on both sides. Now, what progressives, it seems to me the position that progressives have taken is acknowledging that is to say that what we need to do is not be a denomination captured by its culture, but a denomination capable of contributing to and reforming its culture. Now, I'll say a word about that, I think, again, on another one of my charts. And that is, of course, of course all of us are captives of our culture. That, and, and we just have to start by acknowledging that. Um, I try very hard not to be, but we are captives by our culture. In the first place, I can only think about what I can think about. Uh, and by, partly that's a linguistic matter and partly it's a cultural matter. But, um, but, there, but there is, as Richard, has, I think, has outlined uh, very well in his book, this tradition in our restoration movement that quite consciously is countercultural. And, I, and as I said, I, that's how I define myself. Um, people, many of the people, I think, who have been quite critical of the 50s, 60s, 70s kind of cultural captivity of Churches of Christ have themselves been captives of, a, of another culture. That is, they've been captives of a, of a liberal academic culture, so that many of the issues are such as gender issues and uh, they wouldn't even racial issues, I think, uh, worship issues, have been uh, critiques not made from outside the culture, but actually made from a different culture, made from an uh, academic culture. But at any rate, what th those, are, those are questions they're quite central to one of the issues that our restoration movement is about. I, as I say, I think it's about basically two ideas. Let me sidetrack for just one minute and tell you that uh, you, you can say that the early restoration movement had two thrusts, these two thrusts, one restoration and two Christian unity. That, and that is certainly true. Both of those concepts are quite writ quite large in the early literature of the movement. I probably would take a pretty deviant position on that and argue that Christian unity as expressed in 19th century restoration was always understandable only in the context of 19th century uh, thought particularly early 19th century thought. That is, the concept of Christian unity in the early 19th century was just thoroughly based in the, in the Enlightenment uh, optimism, which assumed that unity of all things was going to come about. That it was going to come about through the application of human reason and logic and right thinking and not only would all Christians come together, but all nations would come together and all political systems would come together. So that almost everything that's said about Christian unity in the early 19th century, I, I just ha have to put it in that context. And that is that it was based in this kind of what is obviously quite false assumption that human beings, as a result of human wisdom, were going to get everything straight because so far we have not quite done that. Uh, and, uh, and consequently, you, now you can take that rhetoric still and apply it, but you're applying it in a quite different set of circumstances, it seems to me. So I would say rather that these other two issues, now the second issue is a hermeneutical uh, issue. And hermeneutics has always been quite central in determining these major divisions in the movement as well. In the 19th century division, one of the focus of differences that divided churches of Christ and Christian churches was the emergence of a um, of biblical criticism, higher criticism, and new approaches to the scripture which called in question 
uh, the old common sense, Baconian hermeneutic of saying that every man can go to the scriptures and read and come away with a common understanding of what is said there. And uh, so there are, there are a whole set of hermeneutical issues that contribute to that division. The same thing is true in uh, the 20th century. The new hermeneutic um, essentially just calls into question the basic interpretive framework that has been used to construct our restoration uh, results, the, the results that we've come up with. Now, um, let me just let me make a personal comment or two about that. And uh, by the way, I'd probably say some things that, surely I'll say some things that you disagree with. Uh, and I would be glad for you to uh, take issue with them. If I don't, Please don't tell any of my friends, or they'll be very disappointing. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> but uh, you know the, the present hermeneutical challenge is once again based in uh, academia and is strongly rooted in modern theories of literary criticism and postmodernist and deconstructionist thought. And essentially, uh, theoretical ideas which argue that the old assumptions of um, Baconian logic were, are untrue. Now, I have, to, I have to tell you, I don't like deconstruction very much. And I'm not much of a postmodernist, and I've had it up to my neck. Uh, because in my job that I was in in India as the director of the American Studies Research Center, which is a big American center built by the State Department for where we bring scholars from all over Asia and Africa to study American thought, and I did that for two years, and we brought a whole parade of American scholars, in, including lots of the leading deconstructionists, to talk to the Indians who didn't need deconstructing. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but at any rate, now, now there, there are lots of things that these modern theories have told us. I, I, mostly I think they've told us things that we should have already known, and that is that every person's perception of the world around him and text is personal and individual and quite distinct from anyone else's perception. I think we understood that and that, that there's no, I mean Plato understood that, uh, and that there is no such thing as, uh, that there's no such thing in history writing as total objectivity. I think we understood that. I, I will tell you that my stuff is not totally objective. It is what I think. This book was really hard to write for me. It was also really fun to write. But, but in fact, I would go home every night when I was writing this book, and I'd tell my wife, boy, this is really good. Uh, but <laughs> uh, because I was telling what I thought, Sandy. But because it's quite selective. This presentation is not objective. It's what I think. Well, I think historians, good historians, have understood that for a long time. That's different, however, from saying these are just constructs of the imagination. You know, historians don't just tell anything they want to tell. Now, I could, I could tell you a story of the, civil, of the origins of the Civil War. I could write a book about the origins of the Civil War. And in fact, I could write a thousand books about it, all of them different, all of them based on evidence, all of them having a certain logic to them. And they'd all be different stories, which is why my chemist friends always say, you guys ought to quit writing history. It all happened, and it's there, and it's done, so why do you have to keep writing it? And the answer is because what happened is not history. It's what we tell you has happened is what history is. But um, so, so, there, so there are a thousand different interpretations you could write. But now what I couldn't do, I could write a history of the Civil War and say, actually, the reason 
the Civil War happened was because Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis were secretly in love with the same woman. Be a good story, uh, and uh, and it you know it could even be I could even write something that would be quite compelling and might uh, inspire us and might give us some understanding of what happened. But it but it would not be true in the sense that a historian a historian's stories are not true, but they're based on evidence and logic. And if you if you misuse those things, then you you are rightly the subject of criticism. But we understand that we, we, we can't reach that kind of truth. Uh, I think postmodernism and deconstruction have, have helped us to understand, to some extent, the ways in which uh, hegemonies, power structures, can control thought, and that uh, that people, powerful people can write history for their benefit, so what, what the past is becomes the king's past, or, or men's past and not women's, or rich people's and not poor people's, whites and not blacks. That, that's quite true, that you can write people out of history. And uh, I'm on that wavelength altogether. That's, by the way, I'm just finishing my American History textbook, and the basis of this American History textbook, which I'm writing with four other men who are all have an identifiable reputation of writing religious history is based on the fact that for years I have taught American history and just been perturbed. There, there is no truth except individually perceived truth. And, uh, and that transfers over into the hermeneutical debate. It, it can, it, it, it's worse level, you know, it kind of ends up as a literary venture in modern art in which there are no standards. So, uh, the, the drift in that direction can become a drift to a total kind of anchorless uh, structure in which one's only access to truth is a subjective access to truth. Now, I don't believe that's where the real world lives. And acknowledging that there are always imperfections in our ability to understand truth uh, I, I believe that the world still works on the basis of common sense logic. And that's the way the courtroom works. If you go into the court and get charged with something, I, I tell you what you won't be able to do. You won't be able to tell the judge, well, you know, that's just your opinion. That's the way you read it. Uh, and uh, I read it a different way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and as some of my deconstructionist friends at the university uh, my question to them always is, well, I don't know, why do you guys hand out syllabi for your courses? Because you know the students don't understand them the same way you do, uh, and I don't, I don't know how you give a test. <laughs> but anyhow, so, so you, can, you, can, uh, you can collapse that into uh, a logic that has no end. So what, what I would say is, in the hermen hermeneutical question, 
what happens is we get quite put out by the fact that we can't all agree. I don't like that either. But it seems to me that the real life of real people uh, is based upon a kind of commonsensical effort to say we're trying to do this. Now then, the commitment becomes a commitment not to something, but to uh, a, a quest, a search to try to find what's right. Which is, by the way, um, uh, where I, I would end up in, in this category precisely where progressives are. I can read you quotations from Rubel Shelley out of my book in which Shelley says things about the church that are exactly the way I perceive what the church is, that it's a quest for trying to be a New Testament church, that it's not something we've done, that it's not something that we've creedalized and say so you are a church of Christ because you do these 25 things, but rather it is an ongoing quest to try to uh, be New Testament Christians. I'll tell you, that's my, how am I doing time-wise? Well, i got time to tell you one more story. Let me, tell you, let me tell you my personal testimonial story that's most significant for why I've ended up where I am. When I was teaching at the University of Arkansas a few years ago, one of my best friends, my golfing buddy, was a, one of America's great intellectual historians today, a young man named Michael O'Brien. And Michael's an English guy. He's with a Cambridge PhD, but he's a very bright young man. He was from a working class, socialist, atheist background. But anyhow, when, one day we were playing golf, and I have to tell you about most historians. Most historians are anti-Christian. I mean, they're not just un-Christian. They're anti-Christian. And I, I will tell you why. Because so many bad things have been done in the name of Christian. And so much corruption and perversity has been attached to religious institutions. But anyhow, we were playing golf, and Michael said to me, he said, well, he said, uh, I'll say, he said, somebody told me you were a Christian. And I said, well, that's right, Michael. I said, I am a Christian. He said, oh, he said, that's odd. He said, you know, I've never known an intellectual that was a Christian. <laughs> well, well, I said, well, I said, Michael, your acquaintance is probably fairly narrow, and uh, there, are, there are surely some out there. But I said, now I want to tell you what kind of Christian I am. I said, I don't, I don't have any brief for a lot that goes under the name Christian. And I said, I don't defend institutional historic Christianity at all. I said, the kind of Christian I am is I just try to read the New Testament and just try to be the same kind of Christian that I can read about in the New Testament. And so we played two or three holes and finally he turned to me and he said, uh, well, I'll say, he said, if one must be a Christian, that would be a good kind to be. <laughs> now, <laughs> let me tell you, that I, I, I think that's a good kind to be. That's the only kind I know how to be. And, and, I, I, and I think you've got people on both ends of this spectrum that kind of fall off of that and say that well, I don't want to structure a kind of denominational concept of being a Christian, but I'm willing to live in this environment in which I confess that what we're doing is confessing and trying to reach that goal. And we try to do it within a particular historical context that you need to evaluate and look at and see if you think that's the way to do it, because there are lots of other ways to do it out there. Hermeneutically, However, I, I would be just worlds away from somebody on the other end of the spectrum. I would be cl much closer to people in the conservative wing hermeneutically, although I don't use the hermeneutic in the si same, I think, creedal and, uh, and um, uh, sectarian way. I'm using those terms sociologically and not pejoratively, uh, that they would use them. Well, finally, let me just suggest to you that I think in, in this second division that is going on, 
and it, it, that has gone on. Actually, I think it's over. Um, although lots of people and lots of churches are still in transition and uh, will move. Lot, lots of people moved in the Christian Church, Church of the Christ Division all, all the way into the 1920s and 1930s. Many churches as late as the 1920s changed. There's a famous story when I used to teach up in East Tennessee of a congregation up there that in the 1920s changed from a Christian church into a church of Christ and in an act of symbolism took their piano out on a bluff and pushed it off the bluff. bluff. So, um, so there's lots of uh, movement that's still going on. But the lines are actually drawn. And I think that they are drawn once again uh, on attitudes, that, that what causes these major separatings is not just a disagreement about a thing or two, or it's not really issues, but it's when people come to view who they are and what they're trying to do quite differently, and particularly when they come to hold radically different views of what the church is and what it's capable of being and the hermeneutics by which one approaches what you ought to do. Now, I think that uh, it's, this is also a sociological division, I think. I, I don't know. I hope Doug's collected some good information in this new book. It, he, he, they had, I looked at a couple of articles in which they had outlined some of the preliminary findings of, of that. We, we really need some good information about exactly who is going where. I would be reasonably sure, just anecdotally looking, that this division between the university people and the preacher school uh, preachers is significant of the intellectual divide that's developing. I, I would guess that there are economic disparities in what's happening and the bigger and richer churches going in one direction and other churches going in the other direction. But those are things that uh, we can't empirically verify, I think, at this point, but that hopefully at some point in the future we'll have some good information about that. So that's how I see what's happened in our restoration movement. As I suggested uh, earlier, lots of people would say, well, I wish it hadn't happened. Well, I wish it hadn't have happened, <laughs> too. And we could say that all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century and could say, I wish it hadn't happened, because if we were all back together, we would be the biggest, we'd have four or five million members, you know, wouldn't that be wonderful? But the problem is, we're not all together. We're actually scattered all the way out across this spectrum of American religious thought. I, I've suggested that, that we, we divide real easily because we don't have eccentricities that keep us, keep us from doing it. And the result is that our restoration movement has produced now religious groups spanning from the most liberal wing of American Protestantism. And in fact, the Christian century, of course, the, the leading liberal religious journal among American Protestants began as a, a disciples publication, down to the most narrow and sectarian kind of uh, images that one can imagine of Christianity. So, like us or not, that's who we are. What you need to know, you, you have to make your way through this, and what you need to do is figure out where you belong. I think the greatest tragedy that I see in history is that every now and then I run across somebody who it seems to me ended up in the wrong place. I, I have lots of people who are somewhere else on this chart from where I am who will listen to me talk and say, well, actually, I believe the same thing you believe. And my answer always is, then I believe you're in the wrong square uh, up there, that, uh, that all of us have to finally choose some place where we're going to live our lives. And uh, it's probably better to do that with some kind of historical perspective than without a historical perspective. Okay, Doug, I think our time's about up. Uh, yeah, back, uh, 
to the fifth way. I would like to put the fellowship word in there instead of the social gospel. What about the fellowship? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you're saying. That, uh, you see what he's saying? Uh, you, no, you probably not. You had to have been there. Uh, so that is in the 1960s, the issue of whether churches, what, what churches should do in the way of social. Social gospel. Uh, correct. I, I understand. Uh, what I'm calling the social gospel, he's saying, is an issue of uh, which is biblically authorized under the under the name of fellowship, and that is that that is something that New Testament churches did. So, yeah, that would be a. You would you would adjust to that. Uh, I know, I know. Social gospel, which is kind of a whatever word, I put the fellowship situation. After all, you said fellowship, so I thought I'd just put that on the front of it. Yeah. And I support some stuff for fellowship, and I think we ought to have it. But it was kind of hard to get the kitchen in there, okay? <laughs> or even get the water fountain in there, what about? Hey, this takes me back. Uh, 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 and, uh, I, I mean, you know, I, I could do this, but I think I, I want. I mean, those, those are issues. That, that, that essentially is what J.W. Roberts and I discussed. Uh, and uh, he objected to me calling it social gospel. Um, well, okay. Uh, I, well, I mean, you know, I, I will tell you this. That I, if that is where... The, an argument takes place is can't we, can, can we discuss whether this is something that from a scriptural point of view can be done or ought to be done I, I believe we'd still be talking at that level I, I, what happens is the time came when there, there was not an issue or two or three issues but there were discussions in which people came to conclude well maybe we're not going the same place and trying to do the same thing but that's the kind of an issue that I could get my teeth into and I would be glad to discuss it but I think at this point probably not appropriate but I, I don't mind calling it fellowship instead of social gospel yes where would you put the international churches of Christ on this I, yeah I, I would put them uh, they're, they're in my book just briefly uh, I, I put them in as an aberration. Uh, that is, they are a kind of like, the, to me, the Christadelphians. And that is, periodically, we spin people off who are quite radical. The interesting thing about the International Churches of Christ to me is that it's, it's a movement that is not well-rooted in a Restoration tradition at all. It, it is, it's always been interesting to me that except for the first few years, all of the leadership of that movement has been first generation. And uh, they are they are people who essentially were converted to conversion, and and after that point, felt perfectly free to construct their own uh, kind of movement that that paid very little attention to this long tradition. Now you may not like something in our tradition, but but uh, but I will tell you this, and that is that it didn't just happen overnight. People thought about it, and sometimes. The hard thing for young people to understand is actually people that lived 50 and 60 and 100 years ago had some sense too. That is, they, they didn't just do things arbitrarily and without thought. And I will tell you, everybody stands on lots of other people's shoulders. And there are a lot of things you understand today just instinctively and don't have to think about that somebody else had to think real hard to get there. So that... Uh, but, so I, I would view that as a, as a group that's not much rooted in the tradition at all and consequently has been perfectly free to go its own way and carve its own kind of distinctive history. So I don't, I don't pay much attention to it in the book, but I do talk about it. Yes? Do you see a distinction between the thought there with regard to conservatism and traditional? In other words, a lot of times we fall into a certain tradition. It's yes. not biblical or conservative, as I would say. And uh, I see a distinction between the two. Yes, I do too. And, uh, and, and that's just a, that's a compromise with the use of terms. Uh, and I do regard many people in that middle group 
as quite traditional in their loyalty. By the way, I regard many people in non-institutional churches as traditional in their loyalty. That is, they are, they have a kind of creedal concept of who they are, and they're loyal to that set of propositions. I talk about it in my book as propositional thinking. All of us think propositionally to some extent. That is, I can tell you who I am by telling you certain things that I believe. But if I really want to tell you who I am, I have to tell you what my objectives and aims are. But uh, tr traditional, people become traditional, and you surely know some traditional Church of Christers. That is, people who are in Churches of Christ just because that's where they've always been, and this is what we believe, and this is what we do. I preached in a congregation years ago. It's an old, it had a wonderful old ornate fancy building and just a few sleeping people. Uh, and uh, I told uh, the preacher, I said, you know, most of these people, I don't think they have any idea why they are here. They are just kind of like the pews and the chandeliers and everything else. They just go with this building. So, uh, so, so there, there certainly are people whose notion of who they are is, is not at all different from the way any denominationalist view of who they are would be. But, uh, but that, that is tricky. Of course, conservative is such a tricky word in its own right. So you'd be a Christian, so you are a Christian in the Church of Christ. Yeah, actually. In a way, in a way we're all Christians in the Church of Christ. Yeah, that, that, that's better. Uh, I like that better. Uh, yeah. I, don't, uh, I, think I, I think I'm a member of your church. Uh, well, but I don't uh, think I'm a member of some of these churches. I don't think I'm a member of so. Well, here, here's what I here's what I am. I am a Christian, and consequently, I am a member of the Church of Christ. Exactly. Uh, and I am a member of a Church of Christ. Well, yeah, I am a member of a Church of Christ. Beyond that, I'm not a member of anything else. But I am forced historically into these kind of liaisons and alignments and I I would like to be able to undo that but I don't know any way to undo that but actually if we if we can keep that kind of notion of who we are then I think that's a corrective at least to understanding ourselves denominationally now there are lots of your local congregations that I would not be comfortable in I'm sure and you probably wouldn't I would be. Like, I would like very much to be able to relate to the man who lives seven miles from me, uh, good man, Church of Christ, but he he won't let me in. And he can, he can go ahead and believe what he wants to believe. He's very conservative. Yeah. He runs a real tight ship, so to speak. And, and yet... I can't. I'm a Christian. I, I think we're going to be in heaven. Well, maybe you'll get acquainted there. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and uh, may, maybe not. Uh, David looks like that's the only recourse that we have. Well, well, I want to tell you about Christian unity. Uh, I mean, th th this whole question of Christian unity has come up over and over, and people say, well, sh shouldn't our aim be Christian unity? I don't think that's one of the. the I don't think that's one of the major planks in the movement. Though there are a lot of people who disagree with that. Uh, but I'll tell you about Christian unity. All of us exist with some dissonance. Some, somebody that thinks they don't has just has got their head in the uh, mud. But the question of how much dissonance I can tolerate is an issue of conscience. And any any time any time you take a step toward Christian unity, you take a step away from conscience in some matter of conviction. So what everybody has to do is to decide how much can I compromise my own conviction in order to have relationships with other people. Now, I wrote a series of 16 articles about that four or five years ago, which have gotten me in endless trouble, uh, <laughs> but uh, in which I tried to outline how it is that I do that. But that is a quite central question to all of us. It's a question that, by and large, implicates only what local church I can associate with. Uh, but, uh, but, that, but that is a, a, certainly an issue. That, but, but we can't say 
that, that the solution is to just disregard all our beliefs and love everybody because one of our issues is that I have quite critical beliefs that I think anybody who has my commitment to simply being a New Testament Christian should be trying to do. And consequently, I can't compromise those convictions either. Well, thanks a lot, you guys. You've been very kind. And the rest of, the rest of it's in the book. This summer, I think it's the last week in June, Ed Harrell and myself and Richard Hughes and Tom Albright are going to be teaching a course here on campus, a short course on Restoration History. Now, I'll have my say on Christian unity in that course. <laughs> Do I get to go last? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Tom and I are already conspiring against you in the syllabus. <laughs> oh, no. uh, I think it'll be a wonderful time. If you're interested in uh, auditing that or being part of that class, uh, uh, get information from the graduate office. But uh, we are extremely grateful for what you've done. We are extremely grateful for you coming here and uh, being part of this restoration forum. One of the strongest, I think, uh, I've been here since Dr. Humble began those several years ago, and we've had some wonderful speakers, but this year uh, is one of the strongest we've ever had, and I appreciate so much what, you're do what you've done. Um, let me say to you that tomorrow we'll have two other lectures. Dr. Newell Williams from Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, Indiana, who has just completed a new biography of Barton Stone, uh, which is also available in the bookstore and in several of the vendors in the exhibit area, will be here to deliver an 8.30 and a 9.45 lecture on the material that he's worked on on Barton W. Stone. And uh, you will enjoy that very, very much also. Very engaging speaker as well as an engaging writer. Thank you for being here. Let's close with prayer. We have. Uh, actually, several dignitaries in our midst this afternoon. Uh, one person that uh, that I have, uh, while I don't know extremely well, come to have a great deal of respect for over the last two years because of some conferences that Royce Money initiated, the One in Christ conferences, uh, to initiate some healing processes between black churches of Christ and white churches of Christ. Uh, Dr. Andrew Hairston, who is the minister of the Simpson Street Church of Christ in Atlanta, Georgia. Can I impose on you to lead us in a closing prayer? Thank you. Let's stand and be dismissed by closing prayer. Our gracious Father, we are grateful for <coughs> the opportunity to be exposed to information with which we agree and do not agree thankful for the opportunity of thought and analysis and growth and development. We're thankful for the spirit that drives this university and those who are responsible for its existence. And we're most gracious for the spirit that brought into our world Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior today. In the name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you like our content, if you want to see more videos like this, make sure you leave a thumbs up on our video and you comment uh, what you thought in the comment section. But also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can see uh, our content and whenever we post content. And make sure you follow us on our social medias in the description below. Uh, thank you again. See you next time.